All right, welcome back. Talk Radio 1210 WPHD. Rich Dioli in for Chris Segal this morning. And uh, very pleased to have with me on the line Congressman Representative Mike Fitzpatrick. He represents Pennsylvania's 8th Congressional District. He's also a member of the House Financial Services Committee. Hey, Congressman, thanks for joining me on Talk Radio 1210. Good morning, Rich. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, I was um, thrilled when I read this uh, press release Fitzpatrick bill would trim billions, billions with a B from the federal budget. I like the word billions. I really do. Uh, It's a big word. It's not big enough. Of course, it never is, right? But this is a really common sense, very simple idea. And uh, I'm so glad that you can talk about it with us. It is common sense. And it's something that the private sector has been has been doing for years. And, you know, when when the economy um, finds itself in a diff- difficult condition. First thing the private sector starts doing is they take a look at their budgets and they find out where they can save money. So what we're, what we're proposing is that if you cut 50% out of the travel budgets of the executive agencies and convert that to teleconferencing, which is what the private sector has been doing for years, uh, you can save $5 billion a year. Of course, the federal government, we budget in 10-year cycles, so they always say the 10-year look-ahead is $50 billion. Uh, with fifty one, billion dollars, fifty billion with a B. Now, th- put that in perspective. The, the much hated sequestration process, um, everybody, everybody is so concerned about, <clears throat> comes to about eighty-five billion dollars this year. This is mm. one bill, right? You know, you start putting it to in, in a simple, in a simple uh, idea, um, and one, frankly, that a lot of companies, uh, the industries in, uh, in in Pennsylvania, in the Philadelphia area, they're involved in telecommunications, telecommuting. Um, what they call telepresence now, um, you know, they, they can actually find ways to make money. So you can actually increase employment. I know you'll increase productivity because you have people in their offices rather than in airports or train stations uh, engaged in needless travel. So uh, it's a good idea. Um, you know, I, I love finding and rooting out waste and abuse in the federal budget. This is an obvious one. And, and, and in addition to all that, Rich, it's bipartisan. You know, Congressman, it is bipartisan, and that, that's an important piece of this, too. Congress, obviously, you guys, not you personally, it's always a fascinating thing to me. We like our individual members. As a body, the approval ratings are never good. And part of the reason why I think is because when you have a bipartisan initiative like this, that is real savings to the taxpayers, it's not making headlines and you know, uh, as much as it should, unfortunately. But look, this is bipartisan, Congressman, as you mentioned. You've got... Uh, a Democratic co-sponsor. And as I understand this, and maybe this number's even changed, I think right now you have 32 bipartisan co-sponsors. And, and it's growing. And that's, I mean, we just introduced the bill about two weeks ago, probably less than two weeks ago. And we've got yeah, 30, 35 co-sponsors already, roughly half Democrats and half Republicans. So this is a, this is a, an idea it just makes good common sense. Uh, you know, common sense that I was raised with right up in the city of Philadelphia, taking it down to the nation's capital and hopefully you know, we'll get a hearing on the bill and we can uh, we can get this passed soon. Congressman, if I could ask you, with regards to the federal budget, there's been a lot of talk lately that there's going to be another standoff between the House and the and the president. What right now is is the goal of uh, of the House of Representatives with regards to a federal budget? Well, somewhat historic. Uh, the House has passed a budget resolution. We do that every year. The Senate hadn't passed one for three, I think, about four years uh, because of another bipartisan bill that I was championing last year, which was no budget, no pay. In other words, if you don't pass a budget resolution, you don't get a paycheck. Yeah, I love that. It's just that is, Congressman, that is such common sense, right? And, no budget, no pay. You don't get paid. You don't do your job. You and, don't get paid. Yeah, and uh, and it was so much common sense. It actually was a fight to get it through the House, and the Senate didn't want to, want to touch it. But they were pressured to do the right thing. Uh, because the American people demanded it. So bottom line is we passed the no budget, no pay bill. And within a couple of weeks, the Senate produced a budget for the first time in about four years. So so the Senate and the House both have budget resolutions. We're heading in the right direction. Um, it is it's I understand it's more difficult to get the House and Senate together on a budget solution when times are tough. And you're talking about reducing expenses, not increasing expenses. But that's the economy we're in. That's what we're elected to do. So I'm hopeful going forward, but it's obvious, Rich, you know, when times are tough and the economy's not doing well, that, uh, you know, that, that, that the bigger issues uh, like, you know, debt ceiling votes will threaten, you know, the continued operations of certain pieces of the government. So we just, we need to work through it. And I think, 
you know, if we can find some of these bipartisan solutions around the periphery, around the edges of the budget, and do the small things first, you know, those small things start adding up to big things. You know, millions become billions. My bill is $50 billion. If you put 10 of those together, you know, you've got uh, you've got five hundred billion to half a trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no question about it. Congressman, you know, you have been, I think, a, um, a leader on energy independence. And one of the things that I've always liked about you is you're not afraid to talk about the need for America to become energy independent. And and I particularly like the fact that you kind of represent this notion of saying there, there should be a diverse energy portfolio. What, what do you mean by that, Congressman? Well, you know, if, if you're managing your own retirement portfolio, you don't want to put all of your assets in fixed income or all of your assets. You know, you, you want you want a diversity. And uh, so if, the, if one particular sector of your retirement fund doesn't do well, the rest can carry through the tough times. It's the same in energy. We have so many different types of energy homegrown in this country. We have coal. We've got natural gas. We have oil. The renewables, you know, are important as well. Uh, I'm one that believes um, in the free market that the federal government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. Bravo. Bravo, Congressman. Sorry to interrupt. I just have to give you a bravo because I I, I could not agree with you more. The federal government should not be picking winners and losers. And and both parties, Rich, both parties are guilty of it. You know, they all have their favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say eliminate subsidies for every sector of the energy industry and let them all compete against each other. And if and if natural gas takes off and wins, and I, and I frankly, I believe, and I hope as a Pennsylvanian, but I believe that would be the case, then, then we'll know what works. If, if wind and solar beats everything else without a subsidy, so be it. I right. would support that. But I think you, you have to put them all on a level playing field. The problem is right now, over decades, and both parties participating, the, 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 market, the energy market is so corrupted with subsidies and credits and deductions it's hard to tell what works and what doesn't work. So you almost have to take it back to zero, back to level playing field, and let them all compete against each other. And that's why I propose and support an all-of-the-above strategy. Let them all get on the field mm-hmm. and compete. And, and I think that would be good for the American people. Yeah, Congressman Fitzpatrick, I could not agree with you more because I look at you. Know, you've, you've had for a while these, these SRECs that were given for solar power. And, of course, we know what happened with Solyndra and the billions that were wasted there. When the government picks winners and losers – it has a terrible track record of obviously of picking winners, and we know. And there's also all these unintended consequences. You know, I love the study last week that said for the for the years before your time, the Congress was subsidizing corn. You know, which led then to high fructose corn syrup and obesity and everything. There's always unintended consequences when the government picks winners and losers. The market does its job, and market works. And 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 then if it doesn't work, well, the taxpayers aren't on the hook for that money. Sure. Yeah, and the and the government when they adopt those policies, it's they always have a good intention. There's always a, you know, somebody has a good idea, and the government is going to fix a problem. But as you point out, the unintended consequence is sometimes difficult to imagine in the, in, the, in the genesis of the idea. That that's what hurts the consumer. And so, you know, I'm a reasonable guy. I'm not saying cut everybody off tomorrow or next month, but I think as part of tax reform and tax fairness in this country. We need to tell all the industries, whether it's wind, solar, oil, gas, tell them all you got, you know, pick, pick a time, five years, six years, so everybody can plan their capital improvements and projects going forward, saying six years, these credits are all phasing out. And uh, that, that will give the, the industry time to plan. It will be fairness for the American people, and it will be, I think, outstanding for energy independence, which is not just good for the consumer, not, not just good when you go to buy a gallon of gas at the local gas station, it's good for our national security. Congressman well. Mike Fitzpatrick joins me here on Talk Radio 1210. His bill, Stay in Place, Cut the Waste Act, will cut $50 billion over the course of 10 years by just very simply saying that federal travel should be uh, replaced with video teleconferencing. You know what I loved about this? And by the way, I want to make this point very clear. We should never be in the business of saying, ah, well, what's a billion? What's a billion? We got into this problem as a nation by saying, oh, what's a billion here? What's a billion there? We should be cutting every single possible place we could, because as you pointed out, Congressman, it all adds up. And what I loved about this particular, you, you had your announcement, and you did it digitally, which I think is so cool. Yeah, right, 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 to, a, uh, right to a company in, in Doylestown, Bucks County, um, where this is their business. And they, they've been working with, in the private sector with pharmaceutical executives to cut travel. These companies have been required since the downturn of the economy in 2008 and 2009 
they've been required on their own to cut 50% of their travel budgets. And the interesting thing about the company that I was sitting with, Cisco, um, I was sitting with them down in D.C., when they cut their travel budget 50% and, and converted to video teleconferencing, what they found is they actually, it was not just more productive for the employees because they were in their office and safer because you're not traveling and greener because you're not polluting the air as part of that travel. They actually found that they, their contacts with their customers and their clients increased. So they actually, they actually saw their customers more than when they were traveling to see them. But, you know, as, as you point out, you know, Sometimes Washington can get lost in the big numbers and the big picture. I just want to boil it down to, to an individual employee. Um, there was an article yesterday in a, in a paper down in Washington about the, uh, about the Internal Revenue Service, and it talked about the average executive at the IRS spends between 12000 and 13000 per employee per year in travel. And my average constituent up in Bucks and Montgomery County, they look at that and say, obviously there's opportunity for savings. There was one executive last year who was reimbursed $161,000 for travel from the Internal Revenue Service. Anybody that doesn't think on the micro level that we can't save a lot of money and then you make it federal government-wide, significant savings, and we have to do it. Congressman Fitzpatrick, you brought up tax reform, and I also know that you are involved with the Stop Targeting Our Politics Act, the STOP Act, which would hold the IRS accountable when they when they politically target groups and Americans. The bigger issue of tax reform, which I think has really come to light here with all this IRS targeting and everything else, how, how do we how do we reform this 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 monster that is the federal tax code? I, I think um, I think you do it in small pieces. So, you know, sometimes when you take a look at, at the big at the big issue, it is um, it is so comprehensive and sometimes so daunting that you never get anything done. You talk about it for years. There's plenty to argue about. The No Labels organization that I've affiliated with, which are Democrats and Republicans that are committed to fixing problems, not fighting about them, we said, look, you know, we can, we, we can figure out, you know, all the things we disagree on, and we could start the debate and not accomplish anything. Or we can start with the areas of agreement. So, you know, in No Labels, we found nine bills. One is my, you know, reduce budgets, travel budgets by 50 percent. We're finding the things we agree on. So I would say to the Ways and Means Committee that's engaged in, tax fairness and comprehensive tax reform, you know, start, start with the small areas that you can agree on. If, if you can't agree, if wind and solar and oil and natural gas are fighting with each other and the proxy wars are going on with the individual representatives in Washington, don't try to do it all tomorrow. But as I said earlier, give them six, five, six, seven years and put them on a glide path and talk about fairness. And, and that's the way I would do it. I would take it in smaller pieces. You know, and as opposed to, say, tomorrow having like a flat tax or, uh, or a fair, fair tax it or could, something. It, it could, it, you could do it over time. You know, you, you set the goal. But, you know, a, a shock to the – our economy is pretty big, and any one of these industries, sectors are very big. And if you just change it tomorrow, that would be such a shock to the system. But any time the federal government tries to do something that they call comprehensive, whether it's comprehensive immigration reform – comprehensive health care reform. That means it's going to be a you know three thousand page bill that nobody's read, few people right. understand, right. and the federal government can't even figure out how to implement. Yeah, and, and you know, as you bring that up, Congressman Mike Fitzpatrick uh, joins me here on Talk Radio twelve ten WPHD eight twenty four. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you about, and thanks so much for your time today. It's been a really fun sure. interview. Let's talk about for a second Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. As you just said, whatever government tries to do these and this is this is my problem with the immigration bill as well. It's this is a big issue. Let's slow it down. Read the read the damn thing and, and figure this out as opposed to always trying to rush these things through. I know that Obamacare, it's becoming less and less popular every day. You see that individuals now are understanding that the mandate is going to hit them very soon. The House seems to be committed to to doing everything it can to stop this this thing. Um, can it can it be stopped? Well, listen, Rich, I mean, my, my constituents know very well that I am not a fan of Obamacare, uh, not from the beginning. And, and it wasn't just the substance of the bill. It was the procedure and the way it was passed. It was rammed through that nobody read it without a single Republican vote. So there wasn't even sort of a tip of the hat to the other side of the aisle or those who may have disagreed with, you know, full out government run health care. So that, that's how that's how it started. And it's not just the Republican House opposing we're receiving letters. I, I've received letters as representatives of my constituents back home from um, labor, organized labor, 
from, from the uh, electrical workers, from the food and commercial workers, from the Teamsters, they are saying, and, and they were proponents, I think proponents of the bill in the, in the first instance, supporters of the president, they're saying it's a disaster. They're, they're asking me as, as a Republican representative, help us out of this. So we desperately needed health care reform in 2009 and 2010. I don't think we need the kind of reform that we got. And so I think just like I was saying earlier about, about tax fairness, um, and I voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, so-called Affordable Care Act, I think what we need to do is start taking it, you know, dissecting it piece by piece, taking it apart, deleting those pieces that are, that are really bad. Um, but this is a town, I, and I firmly believe this, Rich, you can't just be against things. You have to be for something. Right. A lot of folks come to Washington, they're again, they, they'll just vote no all day, and they never really have a, have a new or original idea. You know, I've got a health care um, reform plan. It's introduced in the Congress. Um, my co, co, uh, co-sponsor of the bill is Joe Heck, who's a Philadelphia-trained physician, now represents uh, the state of Nevada. And it includes free market health care reforms that I think are good for the consumer because what consumers really want, everybody wants, wants health care. They, they want it really, they want affordable health care. They want the freedom and flexibility to choose the kinds of plans that fit them and their families, not some one-size-fits-all Washington solution that, you know, is unaffordable because the fact is everybody's rates are now going up. So, yeah, you know, and, and, and you're, you're right about that. And, and can, can you give us an example, Congressman Fitzpatrick, of what would be, say, a fair market, a free market reform that could benefit consumers that, that doesn't need gigantic Obamacare to do it? Mm-hmm. Well, one would be the, uh, say, the ability of a health care consumer um, trying to purchase insurance in the individual market. So in other words, you don't have an employer providing it for you. Number one, you ought to get the same tax benefits as the big employer, so it should be fully deductible. Number two, you should be able to buy it anywhere in the country that you want. Like you buy your auto insurance, like you buy your life insurance. If you, if you can purchase health insurance in the state of Delaware, um, and it's a plan that fits you and your family, and you can purchase it on the Internet, I think you should be able to do that. And the federal government should not t- be able to tell you that that's prohibited. 